to the record button right now. And good evening and welcome to tonight's Camden Conference community event, a presentation with Paul D'Orsay titled Arctic Exploration, Science and the Inuit. I'm Brenda Harrington, the program librarian at the Belfast Free Library. Um, we're pleased to host this program along with our co-sponsors, the Penobscot Marine Museum and the Camden Conference. I want to thank you all for joining us. We had a great turnout for this same program two weeks ago, such a great turnout that we decided that we would offer it again. So I'd like to say a special thank you to Paul D'Arce for agreeing to do it again. So thank you, Paul. Um, I'd like to re again remind everybody to keep your mics muted um, the, and let you know the program is being recorded and it will be available on all of our websites um, after sometime after. Um, uh, questions will go in the chat and we will get to them at the end. Before we get to the presentation, Judy Stein from the Camden Conference will give some updates and she will turn it over to Sipperly Good from the Penobscot Marine Museum to introduce tonight's speaker. So take it away, Judy. Okay, thank you. I am going to make a guess that there is nobody here who does not know the Camden Conference is this weekend. Uh, you can still register uh, call if you have not yet. Uh, it is, as I think we all know, totally online. Uh, there's a session Saturday morning, a session Saturday afternoon, and a session Sunday morning. So if you have not registered, go on the Camden Conference website and go for it. I have two other announcements regarding events after the conference. Um, Angus King will be speaking on March 2nd. Again, uh, if you look on the website, you'll find further information. And uh, on March 15th, we are going to uh, stream the documentary Frozen Obsession about research work done in the Arctic. It will show later in the spring on um, public uh, television on PBS, but uh, we've been granted the privilege of running it first and it will be followed on that night by uh, a panel discussion with the film producer, with one of the senior scientists and um, with Edward Stozik, the author of Future Arctic, who was also there at the time of the, the research. Uh, the, the filmmakers were on the ship and I, it, it looks like it's going to be great. So, We've got two events after conference. We've got the conference coming up. And uh, tonight we're privileged again to have Paul. So I'm gonna let Cipperly, the, the Penobscot Marine Museum is a co-sponsor of this event. And I'm gonna let Cipperly introduce herself and introduce Paul. Cipperly, you're on. Thanks. So I'm Cipperly Good. I'm the Richard Saltonstall Jr. Curator of Maritime History at the Penobscot Marine Museum up in Searsport. And we're so happy to have Paul. Uh, Paul's been working on the ocean for almost his whole working life, sailing schooners and other traditional vessels here on Penobscot Bay, and then a research school ship that went to the, nor the Western North Atlantic and the Caribbean. And then he spent the next 20 years working in maritime museums and on historic ships as an administrator, starting in Galveston, then off to Philadelphia, and finally at the, as the director of the Whaling Museum in Cold Spring Harbor, New York. And he's been involved in numerous environmental advocacy organizations on Long Island and here in Maine. And since retiring, Back to Maine, Paul's been volunteering with us up at the Penobscot Marine Museum and other mar mar uh, sorry, marine environmental organizations when he's not sailing either on the bay or on the frozen lakes, which have been good this year. Uh, and Paul, I tasked taught Paul to give this talk after hearing him give a talk on uh, 
he had read a, an account of an 1860 schooner expedition from Thomaston to Greenland, chartered by a Bowdoin College professor and students. And it was such a good talk. I recruited him to talk tonight. So take it away, Paul. All right. Um, thank you, Sipperly. Uh, and I'm going to share my screen here if I do this right. Not at all. There we go. And can I shrink that? No, I can't shrink that. Well, uh, thank you, Sipperly, and thanks to the Camden Conference and the Belfast Free Library and Tom Scott Museum for inviting me back. Um, as Sipperly said, I got interested in this topic when I started to uh, look into the voyage of the schooner Nautilus um, in 1860. And uh, one of the little threads from that was that these um, 18 or so young men of Williams and Bowdoin colleges, um, when they got to Gotthab, Greenland, um, happened to run into a guy named uh, Francis Leopold McClintock, who was in there on a survey for a transatlantic cable. And it turns out that McClintock was a worldwide celebrity because just the previous year in 1859, um, he had discovered what had actually happened to the famous Franklin expedition, um, which had disappeared in the Arctic. Um, what was it uh, 12, 14 years before that? Um, and so that kind of got me going on. I'd heard of the Franklin expedition, so that got me going on some other things. And so I spent the last little while uh, doing a lot of exploring of Arctic exploration. Um, and soon learned it was a huge topic. And so I decided to narrow things down at suggestions from both the conference and separately. Um, so I'm gonna look at just a couple of aspects, um, science and relations with the Inuit in the golden age of Arctic exploration, which is approximately 1818 to a century later or a little less than that. And I'm limiting myself to one corner of the Arctic um, because there's way too much of it and too many explorations. And that is the Arctic archipelago, um, mostly Canada, Greenland is a, a Danish uh, possession. Um, and this is where a lot of activity was focused, first looking for the Northwest Passage, which is in the news of late because it's seemingly going to open up again with the recession of the ice cap. Um, and then later on, as the most workable route um, to get to the North Pole. And those two goals were the motivators for certainly more than 90% of the expeditions um, during that 100 year period. Um, there were some 200 expeditions to the region during that century. Initially, all were British, with the US becoming more involved as the century progressed. A couple of other European countries made forays as well. I'm going to try to avoid naming too many expedition leaders, ships, or geographic points, because so many of them, because so many of the geographic names um, are taken from the leaders of the expeditions. So it gets very confusing very quickly when every Cape bay and point is named after either a sponsor of an expedition or the captain and leader of the expedition. Without an atlas and a scorecard, it's pretty hard to keep them straight. So I'm going to just work around that. Um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of what happened, kind of the history of the exploring expeditions, two minutes or less. Um, after the Napoleonic Wars, the Royal Navy had a surplus of ships and officers ashore on half pay. And a second Lord of the Admiralty who was intrigued by the Northwest Passage. 1818 saw the first of the many Royal Naval expeditions, both by sea and overland, to find the passage. On about the 10th expedition, Sir John Franklin sailed into the Canadian archipelago with the ships Erebus and Terror in 1845 
planning to find the passage and emerge into the Bering Sea in 1847. He, he his ships, and 128 men disappeared completely, sparking a wave of some 30 or more by some accounts, British and US government private and private expeditions over the next 12 years to find out what became of them. Franklin is probably the most prominent one of the explorers in popular culture. Um, and conveniently, um, the Franklin expedition took place right about in the middle of this period of 100 years. So it's a good kind of break point um, and to, to date things both before and after Franklin. Obviously, most of those 30 expeditions did not find the answer to Franklin's disappearance, but the exploration of the Canadian Arctic was advanced significantly, enough to figure out that several passages do indeed exist, though at that time, normally impassable for ice. For the remainder of the century, from about 1860, the Admiralty was loath to spend additional money in the Arctic. And they mounted only one more expedition in 1875. Meanwhile, the US had become more active, sending expeditions to further scout the passage or to seek the open polar sea, a dream that refused to die, or even an Arctic continent and to seek the geographic pole. Around the turn of the century, 1900, Scandinavians made several very significant explorations, including transiting both Northeast and Northwest passages. And in 1909, Robert Perry reached the pole. Science broadly defined was almost always among the objectives of these expeditions, though rarely the primary goal. The holy grails of finding the passage or the pole combined with the difficulty of travel tended to consume the resources and attention of leadership. Usually, even in the most science-oriented parties, only one or two individuals would be specifically assigned to carry out scientific observation and recording. Generally, the officers would be expected to fulfill these duties as ancillary responsibilities. So despite an incredibly hostile and dangerous environment, a lack of resources and attention, and the absence of trained personnel, it's impressive that of some 200 expeditions, 80 of them came back with results that led to scientific publications. Over the course of the 19th century, as science in general advanced and scientific societies gained influence, it appears that the scientific endeavors in the Arctic did become more focused and effective, though chronically undermanned. Oops. So here's another view, actually a navigational chart of the Arctic archipelago. And I can't avoid geography completely. Uh, the basic route from Europe or North America is up through Baffin Bay. This is the entrance to Hudson's Bay, um, where some of the early exploration took place. But to try to find the Northwest Passage, ships have to go up into Baffin Bay and generally through Lancaster Sound in order to get into the archipelago. There are a few other passages, one here and one here. Um, certainly during the 19th century, those were always impassable because of ice. So there's Lancaster Sound, Baffin Island, and up here is Ellesmere Island. And there is a very narrow and very ice prone passage um, up here, which is the route that uh, was preferred for most of the attempts to reach the pole. It's certainly the way, the way Perry chose to go. Oops. Here's a simplified version, so you can see. It actually turns out the most effective passage is down through a very narrow channel down this way near the Canadian mainland. Um, even though it looks like there would be better and more wide open passages, um, certainly during the 19th century, almost always choked with ice. Um, this is what was known of that area by about 1860. Um, as you can see, there are a lot of blanks. Uh, most of the expeditions were by sea um, through Lancaster Sound and down this way, but a number of significant um, forays were made overland in Canada, uh, basically going down rivers 
to the Arctic Ocean, to the mouths of the rivers at the Arctic Ocean. Um, and that contributed a fair amount of knowledge of what was going on as well as the sea voyages. And the problem with all of this is ice. Um, starting in Baffin Bay, there's a huge, typically a huge pack of ice in the middle of the bay that gets in the way of ships. Um, Lancaster Sound, some years was accessible, other years was not. The navigational season when ice breaks up enough that sometimes ships can get through is essentially from the middle of July to the middle of September, which is a pretty narrow window when you think about trying to maneuver a square root sailing ship through, um, I picture it as sort of like a, a, a maze of coral reefs that move. Um, so getting anywhere was extremely hard to do. Oops. Um, the other thing that we tend to think of ice like a frozen lake or whatever is it's fairly smooth. Um, Arctic ice pack is not like that. It's extremely uh, broken up and there are huge pieces of it. And certainly if you're trying to travel over the ice on foot or with dog sleds or man pulled sledges, um, the problem typically is uh, things like this, which is a pressure ridge, which is the moving ice, um, just like continental drift creating mountain ranges, moving ice creates pressure ridges. And if you can imagine lugging gear across something like this, and they could frequently, when trying to travel across the ice, they could, there could be one of these just about every mile. Um, so life, life was tough. Um, this is a little bit of, a little hard to see, I'm afraid, but um, this is the extent minimum extent of the ice pack for several 50 year periods. Um, and you can see that for instance, in 1879, down here is Lancaster Sound and trying to get into the passage. And if you were extremely fortunate in 1879, you might have gotten the ship through here. Um, today, of course, things are much more wide open and uh, the passage has indeed been transited several times. So one of the answers with a very short sailing season and it taking a long time to even get through Baffin Bay and into Lancaster Sound to get to the archipelago, um, the explorers pretty soon came up with the idea of wintering over. And so they would try to um, find a safe, a harbor that would be safe from moving ice, um, secure the ship, button it up for the winter, spend the winter typically doing science um, and trying not to go crazy. Um, some of the more creative expedition leaders um, made sure there was a weekly theater performance, um, classes in all sorts of different subjects. Um, one of them published a weekly newspaper um, during the long Arctic night. But lots of camps were set up in the ice, as I say, ideally in secure harbors. Um, and that's when a lot of the science got done. And typically they would move off the ship and set up some stations on shore for um, setting up instruments and collecting data, um, which gave them, removed any of their sampling from the influence of the ship. It didn't always work out that they found a safe harbor. Um, sometimes ships were beset as the official term is, um, were caught in the ice outside a harbor and would have to spend the winter drifting with the ice pack um, wherever it chose to take them. A number of ships did this successfully. On the other hand, being beset could result in fairly catastrophic events in that ships could be crushed and basically sink, leaving the entire ship's company on the ice. Or if you're lucky, you got away with just some damage, but this is for instance, where the rudder of the ship would have been hung had it not been torn off by the ice, everything bent out of shape and obviously uh, prone to leaking. So um, this is actually a later um, encampment 
this is Fort Conger, but the establishment of shore stations to carry out the scientific project over the course of the winter was something that evolved over the course of the century. So this is one of the earlier scientific charges. Um, Dr. John Ray in uh, 1845 actually was traveling overland um, down a river in um, mainland Canada. And along with trying to ascertain the, the geography, they were still trying to confirm whether something was a peninsula or an island. Um, his scientific charge was to determine astronomically all remarkable points, make bearings of all intermediate portions of the coast, chart these daily, attend all the botany and geology and zoology in all its departments, to the temperature of the air and water, to atmosphere, ice, wind, current soundings, magnetic dips, inclination, aurora borealis, refraction of light, ethnographic peculiarities of the Eskimo, and other observations that may suggest themselves to you. Now, this is while he was traveling some 1,500 miles by dog sled and on foot, uh, living off the land, so he had to hunt and feed himself and his party, um, but he was supposed to do all this science around the edges. So perhaps it's not surprising that not all that much science got done, but it was always part of the charge. And by 1851, the Royal Navy actually codified uh, their scientific instructions to their officers. As I said, it was rare to have more than one or two individuals in an exploring party charged specifically with carrying out science. Often it was just one. And then some midshipmen would be signed on who, for instance, were um, graphically talented so that they could make drawings of uh, animals and plants that were encountered in fish and various other things. Um, and so ultimately the Royal Navy set out a bunch of instructions on how to make observations um, scientific observations on all of the subjects which might be of interest. Um, and if you look at this table of contents, you'll see that the Royal Navy, not surprisingly, puts at the top of the list anything that's going to help the Navy do a better job. So astronomy, as in um, celestial navigation, magnetism, as in magnetic compasses, hydrography, mapping the ocean, taking soundings, tides, geography. Um, then we get to the more traditional sciences, geology, earthquakes, mineralogy, meteorology, which I'm surprised actually isn't farther up, um, atmospheric waves, zoology, botany, ethnology, medicine and medical st statistics, and then statistics in general. Um, one interesting note here is that if you see the author of the section on geology, it's Charles Darwin. Um, and one of the things that happens in the sciences over the course of the 1800s is that um, what the first part of the century, scientists were typically generalists and specialization was something that developed over the course of those hundred years. So, um, Oh, I should also say um, the role of, of the expedition members themselves is as observers and data collectors. Um, they were not scientists. They were not analyzing or synthesizing data or making any um, conclusions. Um, their role was essentially just to collect the information for others to work out any conclusions that might be drawn. Um, and that's actually fairly typical of at least uh, marine sciences, oceanography today. Uh, ship time is expensive um, and generally it's dedicated to collecting as much raw data as possible um, to be uh, analyzed later when there's more time and the overhead is less costly. So one of the first items on the scientific list has to do with navigation. And one of the 
primary criteria for any scientific observation starts out with where was this observation made or where was this sample collected um, and when. And it turns out in the Arctic, even figuring that out is not terribly straightforward. Um, longitude had been figured out, mm, I think 70 or 80 years before the, the first Arctic, Arctic expedition in 1818. Um, and it was reliant on chronometers, um, which are basically very consistent clocks as shown here and sextant observations of celestial bodies. But what you need for a good observation is a celestial body, a clear horizon, which you can see, which requires some amount of light. As in daylight, remember that the Arctic has a night that lasts for several months um, and accurate time. And taking even a very accurate clock um, into conditions where a ship is being jolted around by ice the temperature on board might get well below zero at times and then warm up again. Um, things like the uh, lubricants inside the chronometer can get stiffened up in cold weather. Um, even navigation was pretty tough. Um, if the chronometer was not available, there was another way, or it still is, another way to get longitude, um, which is called uh, lunar di the method of lunar distances, which requires three as nearly as possible simultaneously observations with the sextant, including one that I never was able to successfully pull off. Um, it requires shooting, uh, measuring the angle between the moon and another celestial body, a star or a planet. Um, very hard to do. So even figuring out where they were was tough. And there were certainly some who came back, for instance, saying proudly how far, how close to the pole they had gotten. And it turns out they were in error by a couple of hundred miles. Um, hyd hydrographic observations, even something as simple as finding the depth of the ocean. Um, if all you have is a lead line, a weight on a string, basically, and you're trying to measure several hundred fathoms, a fathom being six feet, it's pretty hard to do. Uh, what happens is the ship cannot be stopped completely and so you drift sideways and so instead of going straight down you're measuring diagonally and you know all kinds of things can go wrong. Um, and so this is a traditional lead line. Down here is the technique for trying to drop it as quickly as possible when you knew the water was extremely deep, which is to line up most of your crew along the side, each with some of the lead line in their hands and try to drop it like a very efficient bucket brigade. Um, so there were alternatives developed over the course of the century to try to achieve accurate depth measurements differently. And over here on the right is one of these attempts, which actually has a little propeller to try to measure the flow of water as this thing drops down through the water column. Um, I don't think it worked very well. And actually that's, even today, um, almost every oceanographic cruise is going to try out some new instruments in the actual conditions at sea. And it's often that they have to go back to be modified so they'll work better. Um, other instruments that were carried, um, certainly weather uh, was an important thing. And these two on the left are mercury barometers. Barometric pressure was, was uh, accurately measured um, so long as they were kept reasonably warm. Um, Arctic conditions can get easily get down to 40 degrees below zero, which happens to be the temperature at which mercury solidifies. Um, there's, another, <laughs> there's another one. Uh, horizons can be hard, I mentioned for celestial navigation, horizon is important for, for taking the measurement. Um, if you have land or lumpy ice in the way, you don't have a good horizon. So there is an alternative, which is called an artificial horizon, which is basically a perfectly level reflecting body. And one of the techniques that they used for that in the 1800s was a basically a pan of mercury 
Um, but if the mercury solidifies, it's not necessarily horizontal anymore. The item on the far right is a Pierce pendulum, uh, which was actually used to take measurements of the force of gravity. Um, there was a lot of interest in getting measurements of the force of gravity up near the poles um, in order to ascertain, um, which we now know, the Earth is not quite a perfect sphere. It's somewhat flattened at the poles and bulges a bit at the equator. And that can be determined with measurements of gravity. That's a very heavy brass, solid brass cylinder, um, about six or seven feet long. Um, so carrying that across the ice was not a pleasant task. Weather observations, uh, this is actually one of the things that has been going on for perhaps as long as mankind has been going to sea. This is a ship's log book, which has observations on wind barometer, uh, temperature, um, and sea conditions. And then this is a um, specifically weather log uh, that was kept on one of the expeditions. It's sort of interesting that today uh, climate si scientists are actually very interested in these old uh, weather records. And for instance, there's a guy named Kevin Wood out at the University of Washington who uh, is collecting, still collecting, uh, weather information from old ships logbooks um, using volunteers. Uh, and I'll confess I only did about two pages of one logbook, but it was kind of fun. Um, and what they're trying to do is use uh, historical records from ships, which give them uh, data points, geographically data points that were not available in um, records that were kept on land. And they're using it to try to develop and check their um, climate models and weather models. Um, lots of these instruments, it was pretty important to get them set up, as I mentioned before, away from the influence of the ship. Um, this was a prefabricated hut that was set up on um, actually shore, but it could have been set up on the ice um, to try to get the instruments um, to give as true a reading as possible. Um, I should mention that that Pierce pendulum uh, that was set up away from the ship on a steady, uh, specially prepared platform of ice. Um, and then it was encased in a basically its own igloo with a pane of glass put in it so that its oscillations, um, timing of its of its uh, swinging of the pendulum could be observed without the observer breathing on it um, because the moisture in his breath could condense and freeze on the pendulum, changing its balance and therefore invalidating the observations. The full sequence of observations took about six hours. So some poor guy had to be out there in the middle of the Arctic night and winter for six hours timing the swinging of that pendulum. Magnetism, um, as you probably know, the magnetic pole is not at the geographic pole. Um, and we now know that it moves fairly steadily. So there was a lot of interest in exactly what was going happening to the magnetic field of the earth up near the magnetic pole. In terms of navigation, it becomes very difficult because the magnetic forces are pulling the comp. Uh, uh, because the lines of magnetic force are curving down towards the surface of the Earth, there is very little horizontal component. So a compass in terms of the directions on the surface of the Earth becomes almost useless. Um, basically, once once the ships came through Lancaster Sound, I, I found at least one logbook account that said we're, we cannot use our magnetic compass anymore. Um, so what that feature is actually called is magnetic dip, which is the vertical component of the magnetic force. This is a dip needle. 
which was observed studiously and religiously. Turns out that there are actually fluctuations in the direction of the dip and the magnetic uh, variation through the course of every day. Very slight, but. And then there was, uh, let's see, this is a Q unifiler magnetometer, which was put in its own ice house um, and observed by the ship's company as appropriate. And that's what a unifiler magnetometer actually looks at. And all I can think of as I look at those little knobs and screws is what must it be like to have to adjust that when it's 30 below zero and you have to take your mittens off. But over the course of time, and this is uh, at about 1860, um, ships had actually spent the winter in quite a number of spots in the archipelago. Every one of those circles, excuse me, every one of those circles is where a ship has spent the winter um, and therefore lots of observations were made. So the, the data, the accumulation of data was building up steadily. Some of the products, um, drawings I mentioned, so sea creatures were definitely recorded. Uh, they tried to bring them back in alcohol, which sometimes worked and sometimes didn't. So drawings were very important. There's an amazing cuttlefish. Botany, pretty good drawing by a young midshipman of the Royal Navy. And there was a lot of interest in ice and geology. Ice obviously on the Navy's interest about what's going on. Um, geology was kind of a growing specialty. Um, and they were very interested in certainly, you know, what minerals, what types of rock and stratigraphy. Uh, so this is a drawing by um, a member of one of the exploring parties of stratified geology. Um, one of the interesting things uh, a number of fossils were found and, and the scientists ashore definitely wanted so fossils whenever they were found. And they were a little bit taken aback to find that there were fossils of what were known to be tropical plants found in the Arctic archipelago. And uh, interestingly, one hypothesis for how that could come about uh, was that perhaps the axis of the Earth's rotation had changed over time. Um, the theory of continental drift actually didn't get officially broached until about 1912 and didn't really get accepted until about 1950. So a lot of the progress of science was feeling its way in what uh, one author, author referred to as a uh, data star situation in which speculation was almost invited. Um, and there was some speculation. The open polar sea took until oh, about 1880 before it, it was entirely abandoned. Um, there was another well-known and respected cartographer who was convinced that um, Greenland was very nearly a continent and extended all the way past the pole and almost over to Siberia. And it took a long time for that to be refuted as well. Birds, uh, that Nautilus expedition, the schooner expedition with the college students, um, as near as I could tell, those lads um, would open fire at anything that sailed by the schooner at, at any time. Um, and the preparation of study skins was a special skill that they were learning from their professor. Um, there are huge collections of these study skins in natural history museums throughout the world. And they are of use. Uh, entomology, um, there was some surprise that butterflies and moths actually make it that far up into the northern reaches of the earth, but they do indeed. And so the publications, some of the, the biggest ones, this one was uh, 
I think it was six volumes of flora and fauna, uh, insects, fish, um, so on and so forth. Um, so a lot of, of good, good solid science came out of Arctic exploration, even with part-time data gatherers and distractions of trying to get where you're going and survive in a hostile environment. Um, some of the things that overlapped are scientific events, which influenced Arctic, well, science in general, and including therefore science in the Arctic. Um, in the 1870s, the Royal Navy sent out the Challenger expedition, which was the first specifically oceanographic voyage ever undertaken. Um, and that led to a lot of increased understanding of the oceans, increased interest in the oceans, um, a lot of development of um, more effective instrumentation in order to do hydrographic research. Um, and the other <clears throat> significant event was in 1859, Darwin publishing um, The Origin of Species, which certainly has impacted the study of biology ever since. In 1881, or excuse me, 18, yeah, 81, 82, um, there was an International Year of the Arctic um, in which the United States participated. Interestingly enough, the um, England did not. Um, and some seven or eight countries um, manned observation stations ringing around the Arctic. And the United States has the distinction of having the one farthest north, number nine here, was actually Fort Conger and the Greeley Expedition. Um, that was that fairly significant, substantial shoreside uh, building that I showed earlier on. Um, the Greeley Expedition did a lot of work on uh, gravity and magnetism, uh, weather observations and so forth. Um, unfortunately, uh, it came to a fairly tragic end. Um, only a few survivors ended up getting out. The, the plan was to get ships up to retrieve them. And for two years, the ships did not make it anywhere near them. Um, and unfortunately in their escape, which entailed uh, first and small boats and then walking south to try to find help, uh, most of their data was lost. But the year was significant in that it was the beginnings of international cooperation in science and reflected the increasing specialization of the sciences. So moving on, okay, on time. Um, this engraving uh, was made from a drawing by John Sackhouse who was actually a Greenland Inuit who had traveled to England on a whaler in 1816 and returned to Greenland as Captain John Ross's interpreter in 1818. And it depicts the, the expedition's first encounter with the Inuit of Northwestern Greenland, of people who had, no con had had no contact with the Inuit communities farther south and whom Sackhouse actually had trouble understanding. A guy named Pierre Berton, who's the author of many popular books on Canadian history, um, cites this picture as the essence of the differences between the two cultures and reveals many of the causes of unnecessary future failures, suffering, and even death that the British and other explorers would endure over the next few decades in the Arctic. And Burton then goes on to, to analyze the differences uh, and basically the mistakes that the Europeans were to make. Um, and he starts with clothing, um, contrasting the furs um, worn by the Inuit and which they had found um, would enable them to survive in the clim polar climate um, for centuries. Um, and Ross and his second in command are wearing the same clothes they would wear on a beach in Tahiti. 
or in a salon in London. Um, and it's not very practical for staying alive in the Arctic. The seamen under their command were issued clothing of wool and canvas, both of which would prove to be inadequate, if not an outright liability for survival in the Arctic. Their ships, <clears throat> just the thing for the Battle of Trafalgar, actually one of them bombarded uh, Baltimore in the War of 1812, uh, were too large and unwieldy for effective ice navigation. They were provisioned with foods which would leave entire ship's companies crippled and dying of scurvy and malnutrition. Where the Inuit clearly traveled light in small groups using dogs, hunting and feeding themselves along the way, the British insisted on dragging provisions, canvas tents, equipment, and even boats by manpower alone. It would be nearly a century before the two cultures recognized the need to understand and learn from each other. So the Inuit um, basically are believed to have come across the land bridge from Siberia and spread from west to east, arriving in the eastern part of the Arctic or the, actually the west coast of Greenland uh, along about 1000 or 1100 in the Christian era, which is actually after the Norse had been there and, and actually the Norse settlements had declined by then. Um, they are, there are slightly different related peoples and cultures. Um, over towards Alaska are the uh, Inupiat and then in Siberia are the Yupik, uh, but they are considered to be distinct um, populations. Clothing was the first thing Berton mentioned, and uh, the fur clothing of the Inuit is amazingly practical and effective, um, but very different from what Europeans thought they should be wearing. Um, they are made of furs of animals native to the region. Um, they are relatively loose fitting. Uh, but fur has a number of qualities which wool and canvas do not. Uh, first of all, it tends not to absorb moisture, which is a real enemy in sub-zero temperatures because any moisture from your breath or any perspiration turns to ice. If it soaks into your clothes, your clothes become rigid and heavy, as does your tent, um, and it doesn't work well at all. It took forever for Europeans to figure out that this was the way to dress. Um, footwear. Um, I shudder to think how many English and American toes were in, were lost um, during Arctic exploring expeditions. Um, the Inuit wear two pairs of boots, uh, both fur, one fur side in, the other fur side out, and sometimes even add a third layer to ensure waterproof, waterproofing. And there you can see a fully fitted out couple of feet and legs. Um, some other Inuit innovations, uh, snow goggles. Snow blindness is a very real thing. There was at least one English sledding party that had to start traveling at night because if they tried to travel during the day, they went blind and it took several days for them to recover their sight. And the Inuit knew how to avoid that. Travel. For some reason, the English thought it was best if men pulled sledges by manpower alone. And this was an occasional Royal Navy explorer would use dogs, but for the most part, they seemed to think it was nobler and more efficient to do it by manpower. They also tended to overload their sledges um, so that, for instance, seven or eight men would be trying to pull 1400 pounds of sledge and load. Uh, chances are trying to pull the boat in this image was even heavier than that. Um, they did experiment with 
using sails and even kites to try to help out. Um, but if you remember what those pressure ridges looked like, um, you know, it's not, not like ice boating today where we look for very smooth ice and, and can zip right along. Um, trying to sail over a pressure ridge is not going to work and the sail is just going to be one more thing to carry up and over. The sledges themselves, um, Inuit sledges are very lightweight and flexible. Um, the English and Americans started out with sledges that were way too heavy um, and rigid, which means they just tend to break. Dogs. For some reason, uh, the English were reluctant to use dogs. I'm not sure it's totally reliable, but I recently saw something that said, two dogs can do the work of one man, but they eat less, they don't require, require clothes, and they don't require shelter. Um, there's clearly a reason why the Inuit have gone to the trouble to breed and keep dogs. They've found them useful. Uh, yes, they have to be fed, uh, but they have a lot of uses. So with a light sledge and dogs, Inuit can travel much farther than a band of Royal Navy seamen trying to drag an overloaded sledge. Shelter. Inuit can build a snow hut in an hour or two, apparently. Um, and snow huts have the advantage that, first of all, you don't have to carry it with you. So you're traveling lighter in the first place. Second of all, uh, you don't have problems with the moisture from your breath or cooking or a lamp flame um, condensing and uh, soaking into your canvas tent. Um, apparently the, the canvas tents after a few nights of use would weigh two or three times what they had originally and be stiff as a board when you try to uh, fold it up and get it back on the sledge. Also, sleeping in furs, uh, you're not faced with a wool blanket flag that has become as stiff as a board. It too needs to get packed and to travel the next day. There's a fairly typical tent. Um, this is actually a depiction of the discovery of um, the survivors of the Greeley expedition, that international polar year or Arctic year. Um, after they had walked south and basically could not move anymore and fortunately were discovered then. Um, this is a um, community, a winter community of snow huts um, that very happily um, a guy named John Ross's second uh, trip to the Arctic um, where he got caught for three winters but very happily he was close to a community of Eskimos who basically kept him alive. And excuse me, Eskimo is not the right term, Inuit. The other thing the Inuit were much better at than English naval officers was hunting. Uh, for some reason, most of the English explorers seem to be terrible hunters. Um, as near as I can tell, it's a combination of things. Uh, one, the Inuit knew from experience and oral tradition where game was to be found and where it was not to be found. Um, they were patient. Um, there are stories of Inuit hunters spending 12 or even 24 hours uh, waiting by a seal's breathing hole to try to get the seal when he comes up to breathe. Um, apparently the Royal Navy was not very good at that. Um, and in part, they may be excused because they weren't dressed to stay out for 24 hours standing still. The Inuit also used dogs in hunting musk oxen. Um, they would basically get the uh, oxen to, to circle up to try to defend themselves, which meant that the hunters could then approach and make the kill with arrows. And here's a hunter who's managed to kill a polar bear with arrows. Those expeditions that did come in contact with the Inuit were very fortunate. Um, there are numerous times that basically Inuit encounters with the Inuit um, 
basically accounted for the survival of the Europeans. Um, I mentioned Ross, who spent several winters um, and was able basically to barter for uh, the food that the Inuit, his Inuit neighbors were able to hunt. Expeditions sometimes would take one or two Inuit hunters with them, um, and they were able to, those, those one or two could basically bring in enough meat to keep everyone alive. Um, the problem was if anything happened to either of those one or two, um, the whole expedition could be in real trouble. Um, relations, for the most part, were very good. There was very little hostility. The earlier explorers, um, the Frobishers and Baffins and Hudsons in the 16th century, um, had had some hostile encounters with the Inuit. Uh, but for the most part, in the 19th century, there, there are almost no accounts of any even uh, serious disagreement. Um, Ross actually, what broke the ice with his neighbors was when he had the ship's carpenter fit out an Inuit man who was an amputee, had him fitted with a uh, prosthetic leg, a peg leg. Um, and uh, that the gratitude for that basically ensured that they were gonna be on good terms for the rest of the, the stay. Ross also discovered that the Inuit had a tremendous understanding and knowledge of geography of the region. And he brought some of his neighbors down into the aft cabin, asked them to sketch out the geography of the place they were spending the winter and basically saved him a whole lot of time and trouble and risk by giving him a really good rendering of the Gulf of Boothia. Just to mention that, that strange name Boothia, um, a guy named Felix Booth, as in Booth's gin, um, underwrote the cost of a couple of expeditions. And so he got bays named after him. Ultimately, Europeans and Americans figured out that they had to dress like the Inuit in order to survive. Um, this is a guy named Hall. This is Perry. Um, and they, almost every expedition would at least schedule a stop in Northwest Greenland um, in order to have fur clothes made for them so they could carry on for their journeys. There's an Inuit sled. This is actually a sledge that uh, Perry used. It's at the museum at Bowdoin College, the Perry McMillan Museum. Um, tied together, not rigid, relatively lightweight and flexible. The ships, this is the Erebus and Terror. They're about 350 tons each, um, 70, uh, 65 people on each of them. Um, this is the Fox, um, which was McClintock's ship in 1858 and 59, where he actually found out what happened to Franklin. Um, it's about 170 tons, about two thirds, the size, a little less than two thirds the size of the others, um, about 23 in the entire ship's company, fewer mouths to feed, um, and, um, a much more efficient steam engine. So they trying to sail through ice fields is really difficult. So an efficient engine and enough fuel to keep it going is pretty important. So today, what's still going on here? Well, one of the most interesting things is that Franklin's ships, the Erebus and the Terror, have recently been discovered um, underwater. They both did sink eventually. Um, and interestingly enough, um, we're finally starting to learn to, to consult the Inuit for information. Um, ultimately, these ships were found in large part because of an Inuit named Louis Kamukak, who lived on Prince William Island, um, who made a point of collecting all of the stories he could find in his community about the two ships and the Europeans who had disappeared 150 years before. And when he put them all together and sorted things out, 
he was able to point the archaeologist pretty much to the two spots where those two ships were found. And then another one that comes back up to today, this is the Fram in 1893. Um, Friedhof Nansen um, spent three years actually drifting through the Arctic ice, carrying out research, um, much like the mosaic project um, of this past summer, which you may have heard about. Um, so overall, relations with the Inuit. I think one of the ways I've come to see it is it's very much like European mountaineers and the Sherpas. Um, they don't seem to get much credit, but they deserve um, all the credit in the world because nobody would make it to the top of the mountain without the help of the Sherpa. And I don't think anybody made it very far in the Arctic without at least leaning on the knowledge of the Inuit, if not their direct help. Why did they think I have another very casual theory. Um, why was there no hostility? Um, part of that, I think, is the good nature of the Inuit. The other part of it may be that, unlike other European encounters with indigenous peoples, the Inuit didn't really have anything the Europeans wanted. Uh, the land is not productive. There are not valuable minerals. Um, there were not enough Inuit to be a good market for European manufactured goods. Um, there are basically no raw materials available from the Arctic regions. Uh, they could afford to get along. They didn't have to be hostile. So I have enjoyed my little adventure into science and relations with the Inuit. I thank you for joining me for an hour, and I hope now we can have a few minutes, we can entertain questions. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I, I have to unshare, how do I do this? So if everyone can type their questions in the chat, if you have any questions. So Paul, why do you think the Navy was so reluctant to take real scientists on expeditions? I'll let you close out. Oh, I think at the top, if you do view options, you can stop share up there. Can you see that? Oh, there, we go. there we go, So Paul, with everything frozen in the winter, how did people get water to use? They, they had to melt ice. Um, and that, that often was, was one of the real dilemmas because you have to have some kind of fuel to melt ice. Um, and so some of these guys who were, were basically stuck having to walk across you know, the, the Arctic ice fields, um, fuel was a real critical consideration. And th there was one case where um, they were using ethyl alcohol as fuel and they had a problem with a one crew member who seemed to be drinking the fuel. <laughs> so why do you think the Navy was so reluctant to take real scientists on the expeditions? I, oh, um, real scientists, um, I, I think it, it would have been in part more mouths to feed. Um, and I think they were also concerned about uh, discipline. They, they 
preferred to have an entire ship's company um, who were accustomed to naval discipline. And, and there, there certainly were some of these expeditions where kind of outside scientists turned out to have a real problem with military discipline. And not in the form of saluting or that kind of thing, but just, you know, following orders. Uh, what were the Inuit sleds made of? Um, basically driftwood and bone. Um, so, you know, animal bones, well, especially, you know, if you could get whale bones that are big enough to make things out of, um, and then driftwood. Wood does appear from time to time. And actually the, the, uh, some of the stories about that, that helped lead to where the Erebus and the terror went down were because when the Inuit discovered these sources of wood and metal, um, they would go and scavenge whatever they could. So, you know, the, the Inuit remembered where they were, not so much because, oh, that was a ship or whatever. It was like, oh no, that's where you can get wood and metal, uh, which are really useful items. So how were these expeditions funded besides the gin guy? Oh, well, um, many, probably most, were, were government funded, at least in part. Um, there were cases where um, a donor would, would fund, would purchase a ship, but then offer it to the Navy um, for manning and operation. Um, so certainly government funding played a big role. Um, for Franklin, um, Lady Franklin, his widow, actually raised a lot of money for a number of expeditions. Um, and McClintock, though he was a naval officer, was actually sailing a ship that Lady Franklin had acquired, um, and she was funding that expedition. Um, a guy named uh, a newspaper publisher of the New York Herald, James Gordon Bennett, uh, Jr., in later years funded a couple of expeditions and he was looking for um he had uh, sent stanley out to find dr livingston in in africa so he was just looking for another good story to sell newspapers uh, what's i don't know if you know this or not but what is inuit life like today in these areas and do they still hunt and dress in the same way um I, I don't know very much. Um, they, they, they do still hunt, though they use firearms. Um, and certainly out on the ice, you know, out and exposed, they appear to wear uh, fur clothing, that it's the most effective. Um, there are a lot of stories, and I suspect this weekend might reveal a whole lot more about it. Um, their diet has changed. Um, you know, they now have processed foods available. Um, their health has apparently ch suffered somewhat because of that. Um, and certainly what I've seen of pictures and films and so forth um, in their settlements, um, they dress in, I don't know what you would call it, modern day clothing. Um, was there any international rivalry or conflict over the Arctic in the 19th century? It, it didn't seem to be, um, th there was certainly rivalry. I, I don't think there was any conflict. Um, there were, you know, especially the race to the pole, there was, there was some, some hard feelings about, hey, are you encroaching on my territory or whatever? Um, but it's relatively, um, free of, of hostility, and there, and there was that that International Year of the Arctic, which was was you know Germany, Scandinavians, um, I think the French participated, um, the U.S. You know it, it was the beginnings of an international scientific community. Uh, how did explorers and the Inuit avoid getting scurvy? <laughs> the Inuit avoid it um, by eating 
raw meat and fat. Um, the explorers did not avoid it. Uh, there were horrible instances of scurvy. Um, some managed to escape it. Um, some took lime juice with them or lemon juice, which I think actually has more vitamin C. Um, there was one group that had a problem that they didn't have enough fuel to melt the lime juice. So they stopped giving it to everybody and then they had scurvy problems. Um, it turns out that the Inuit diet eating basically all of the animal um, gets them enough vitamin C to avoid scurvy. Uh, we might learn about this more this weekend, but can you comment on the current battle between Russia and US over claims to the Northwest Passage areas? Oh, no, I'm gonna leave that to the folks this weekend. They're, okay. they're gonna be much more expert on that. Uh, what role did the Arctic whalers play in exploration? Do you have any good stories from Cold Spring Harbor? Um, well, there, um, there, there are a couple. I mean, the whalers were up there before the explorers got there. Um, they didn't, the whalers didn't go as far, but they, they were in Baffin Bay, definitely. Um, they certainly rescued a number of explorers. Um, and one of the neatest ones is that um, one of the ships that the British had sent in, the, the Resolute, got stuck in the ice. Um, the crew was actually ordered to abandon the ship and walk east to connect with another ship in the expedition, which sailed back to England. And like two years later, the Resolute was carried by the ice out into Baffin Bay. A whale ship saw it, came alongside, said, hey, there's nothing much wrong with this ship. Let's take it home with us. So they sailed it home to New London. Um, the US government by then realized what ship it was. The US decided that as a friendly gesture, they would rebuild the ship, restore it, bring it back and give it back to England, which they did. And ultimately, when the Resolute was scrapped, a couple of desks were made out of it, one of which is the Resolute desk in the Oval Office of the White House. The other one, I think Queen Victoria had somewhere. Great. Um, I think we'll end with this question. The timeline for the Inuit immigration into the Arctic, how do we know this is really the timeline? Are there any artifacts that can be used to date the settlement? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's from archaeologists. Uh, I I can't give you the the details of it, but um, they actually replaced an earlier culture referred to as the Dorset. No, nobody seems to be sure how that <clears throat> how that came about, except that the Inuit seemed to have a couple of adaptations which made them better equipped to to thrive. In, in that climate, um, dogs being one and apparently more effective tools and hunting weapons. Um, I believe it's established through archeology, span but I really don't know the details. Well, thank you so much. It's a thank pleasure you. as always to talk to you. Thank you all and good yeah, night. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. You, that was really wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. See you this and weekend. Thank you for coming. Bye.